So hello everyone, uh, welcome to this talk, Toy Fail. Uh, I hope that it will be interesting. My name is Christian, I'm a software developer at the Norwegian consultant business called uh, Bobe, where I work together with Martin here. And myself, I have a fairly varied background and I have worked on everything from web applications to positioning systems for the subway in Oslo. And in short, I'm an engineer and I love to work with technology. So, my name is Martin. I work together with Christian in Bouvet. For the last 10 years, most of my project has been about writing enterprise software for large banks and oil companies. That is, of course, lots of fun and interesting. But sometimes you get some of these small interesting projects that really makes a difference. For instance, to do a secu security review of internet-connected toys. First, a little about the agenda for this talk. Uh, we will start out by explaining the background for the project, go on to show you how we did the security testing on the toys, we will reveal some of our findings, and we will finish off by showing you what happened when we published our results. The customer for this project was the Norwegian Consumer Council. It is a consumer protection organization that who, who works to increase <laughs> increase consumer influence in society and to contribute to consumer-friendly developments. So, why would the Norwegian Consumer Council be interested in internet-connected toys? More and more consumer products are connected to the internet. And while there are strict regulations when it comes to physical aspect of a toy or a consumer product, like fire safety, toxicity, choking hazards, and stuff like that, there is a lot less focus on information security and privacy in the same toys. We did this test before GDPR, so now the regulations had gotten a bit better, but we are very uncertain if, in practice, like what they're doing to the toys has changed a lot. So the big difference is that now there will be big fines if they don't comply with the new rules. So it will be interesting to have a new look at Kyla now, and see what they have done. These devices are often produced by companies that don't necessarily have a lot of experience in the field of information security, and their main focus is often to ship as fast as possible rather than to make it secure. And we have had quite a few incidents. One of my worst examples is uh, some denial of service attack that turned out to come from a bunch of hacked web cameras. And for my case, it doesn't get a lot scarier than that. Another concern is that uh, security flaws in connected devices is, all, is usually very hard to fix. There is often a very limited interest from the manufacturers to fix something in a de device that they have already sold, especially if it is not in sale anymore, so they are not making any money on it. And in some, or actually many cases, they haven't e even added firmware uh, update ca capabilities to the product. So if we discover a nasty bug in uh, a connected device, there is no way to update it. So the only, way, the only thing you could do is throw it away and buy a new one. And that is not good for anyone, especially the environment. And even if the manufacturers do provide security updates, the Many customers are very reluctant to update because while most people have eventually learned the hard way that you should update your computer to keep it safe from viruses and exploits, very few do the same to their laundry machine and toothbrushes. Before we go on, we must explain a bit of, uh, about the scope for this project. It was a fairly small project with a limited budget. Therefore, we could not test all the toys, and we could not test everything. So we had to do a selection. And the devices we chose to test was the top sellers in Norway at the start of our project. <coughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, so here they are. Um, the focus of this talk. This is IQ, and this is Kyla. They are functionally basically the same, and their biggest difference is really in their personalities and how they look. And if you can't tell by the pictures which one is marketed for the boys and which one is marketed for the girls, I can tell you that <coughs> while IQ prefers to talk about science and making jokes, Kyla 
likes to talk about cooking and helping her mother. <laughs> so in other words, like the gender stereotypes from the 60s are still alive and well in today's toys. And the dolls, dolls are manufactured by a company called Genesis Toys, and they claim that IQ and Kyla are the world's best talking dolls. And I'm just going to show you a short commercial from, oh, from the dolls. Let's see here. So this is a commercial for Kyla, which ran on TV. Kayla knows millions of things. Ask Kayla almost anything. What's your name? My name's Kayla, and yours is Abby. She understands you? Kayla knows millions of things. How do you bake a cake? Mix eggs, flour, milk, butter. Wow! Let's play a game. What's this? The Eiffel Tower in France. Incredible! Nice move. Kayla's so smart and so cute. I hear that a lot. My friend Kayla talks, listens to you, plays games with you, and knows millions of things. And there's another commercial for IQ this time. Check this out. The amazing IQ. IQ is a gamer, talks trivia, and knows more than you could ever learn. How much is the Earth worth? 5.96 trillion tones. What does he eat? Computer chips. <laughs> What was the biggest dinosaur? I can answer that. Oops, I launched the turbo. IQ, he knows millions of things. Yeah, so they are a bit different in the way they are presented. Uh, let's just go back to the presentation here. Uh, oh, there we go. So both IQ and Kyla represents what the industry are calling smart toys. They utilize uh, modern processing power, algorithms, and the cloud to enable powerful new features, such as playing games, having conversations, remembering your name, or even your child's favorite color. And furthermore, they can answer almost any question, including stuff like, what is a potato, or what is 2 plus 2? And to help them answer these questions, they search the internet for answers. More specifically, IQ and Kyla uses Wikipedia, Google, and a weather service called Weather Underground. And really, then, just a simple text-to-speech function is used to read back the answer. And even though IQ and Kyla are smart toys, there isn't really anything smart about them in terms of hardware. However, your smartphone is pretty smart. And the dolls themselves are, are actually just a speaker, a microphone, and maybe most importantly, a Bluetooth chip, which en enables them to, com to communicate with your phone. And your phone, of course, has access to the whole internet through either 4G or Wi-Fi or similar. And in essence, all of the logic is being handled by an application running on your phone, which you can download on either the, either the App Store or the Play Store if you're on Android. The dolls themselves are basically just dressed up Bluetooth hands-free headsets. So let the testing begin. We started out by examining the communication between the mobile app, that was Android or iOS, and the internet. Earlier projects had shown that many of those, these apps sent huge amounts of data, including personal information to third parties like advertising networks. So our customer wanted us to check that carefully. We also wanted to see what was sent, where it was sent, and if the information was properly encrypted. The easiest way to do basic, do basic testing of that is usually to use, a, use Wireshark or a web debugging proxy such as Fiddler. For the initial test, we choose to use Fiddler because it is very easy to set up and it has great protocol support for things like HTTP, JSON, XML, and so on. Uh, it also has uh, a really neat feature to, to, that allows you to resend and manipulate the data that is going to the server. So it's very nice for studying what happens if the server gets uh, unexpected data. Another great feature is that it actually does HTTPS decryption. And that allows us to look at the data even though it is encrypted. So HTTP encryption is usually very hard to break. But since we control the client, there is a simple way around the encryption. We generate a fake root certificate, uh, which we install on the client, and then we redirect all the traffic from the client through our monitoring computer. This is known as a man-in-the-middle attack. 
We do not break the encryption, we just tell the client to encrypt using a known key. Much of our motivation for doing this talk is to start, get people to start paying attention to how much data your apps and devices are collecting about you. And since Fiddler is so easy to use, we thought we could just as well show you how to use it so that you can, so that you can go home and have a look at your apps and devices, what they are, what they are sending home about you. Fiddler has a really simple installer. It's a Windows application, so you just click through it. Uh, but to capture data from external devices, you have to configure that. You have to take a note of the port Fiddler is listening on, and you have to check the mark allow remote computers to connect. And to de decrypt HTTPS traffic, you have to enable that. And you will have to generate a root certificate from Fiddler and export that so that you can install it on the device. Installing that, the root certificate, is surprisingly simple. I usually just email it to myself, open it on the phone, and hit install. Then there is some warnings, <laughs> sometimes a lot of warnings, so just in ignore them and install the do not trust the root certificate. Remember, if someone else sends you something like this, <laughs> never install it, and if you do it yourself, Make sure to remove it after you have finished testing. And you also have to configure uh, a Wi Fi uh, proxy server and use the settings you found in the previous slide. This is really simple and you will be up and running in four minutes and then you can be ready to get, to get scared <laughs> about what the, the apps are sending about you. Because of client isolation, it's often a lot easier to just uh, run uh, Fiddler or the monitoring machine in, uh, in the cloud. We used Azure, and it's very straightforward. Just the same, you just have to rem remember to open a port for it. And in other cloud providers, it will be the same, just somewhere else where you open the port. So, when it's all set up, we could start running Fiddler and see what, uh, what is happening. As you can see, there will be a lot of data coming in. Most of it will be from other apps, because they're all like working in the background, sending the data back home. And if you're trying to find out what Kayla is doing, then you need to get rid of the, all the noise. So close down everything that is not the app you're looking for. And even if you have closed down everything, there will be data that is not related to your test. There will be system services going on and stuff like that. So you have to do some filtering as well. On iOS, this filtering is pretty simple because uh, iOS sends data to iCloud, but on Android, it's a bit harder because uh, Android uses Android ser like, uses Google services, and the apps you're trying to monitor could also use uh, Google services. So you should be a bit more careful there so, so that you don't miss anything. So each line represents one re web request, and I've just marked one of them to show you an example. If you have really good eyesight, you could be see <laughs> this is uh, the raw view of the header and the body. Uh, Fiddler also understands JSON, so it will give you a much clearer view. You can see the same in the raw view, but uh, when you get uh, JSON, it's a lot, it's a lot simpler to, to watch it in this manner. And if you zoom in a bit, we can see that it uh, sends the device ID to a third party. And this is typically stuff that we're looking for, because this, this would enable the, the, the advertising network to track you across multiple apps. And if they also catch more information, they could uh, track you across multiple devices. However, Fiddler is not bulletproof. Uh, there are several ways for the app to detect monitoring or to block it or do both. Maybe if it de detects monitoring, it could stop sending the nasty stuff. So you should be a bit careful. This is an uh, example that we found in one of the apps, not the Kale app, but some other apps for another project, where they did this attempt at SSL pinning. This is a very crude attempt at SSL pinning, because they just checked the name on the certificate, and if it was the correct name, then it was OK, and if it was not, then it failed. So it was, of course, very simple for us to just change the name of the certificate and go through. But there is better ways of doing this. And then you have to do more work. 
And we will, to get this code, we did a decompile of the app, and we'll show that a bit later, how we did that. Yeah, and we also did Wireshark to make sure that nothing slipped through, through our fingers. So Christian is going to tell a bit about Wireshark. Yes, uh, so in addition to Fiddler, as Martin said, we use a tool called Wireshark, which is known as a packet analyzer. And it does not have the powerful capabilities of Fiddler, such as being a proxy server, but it is able to read a lot more of the nitty gritty details of what is going on in the network stack. And I will show you what I mean. Because Fiddler is able to pick up HTTP messages, which exists in the application layer of the network stack. But Wireshark goes a lot deeper. It can read from the transport layer, like TCP. It can read from the network layer, like IP datagrams. And it can even read from the link layer. And Wireshark is basically able to see everything that is going on in the network. So there isn't really any point in setting up a proxy server. The only thing we have to do is make sure that we funnel our th traffic through our computer running Wireshark. And we should be able to see all of the packets that are going by. And in the user agreement of the dolls, the user has to agree that recordings made while playing will, can be used freely by Genesis Toys. And because of this, uh, the consumer console wants us to see if uh, play sessions were indeed being uploaded. And we were fairly certain that they were. Uh, but it was of interest to see where this data was being uploaded and, of course, how it was being sent. Like, was it secure? And because Fiddler cannot pick up, on, pick up on these kind of data streams, we had to use Wireshark. And we will soon show you a demo of Wireshark uh, using a previously recorded session with Kyla. Uh, but before we do, I would like to tell you about some of like, how we made recordings and some of the difficulties of using Wireshark and why it's often easier to use Fiddler, if you can. Because the biggest strength of Wireshark is arguably also its greatness weakness. It is able to pick up messages from all over the network stack, including very low-level protocols, which you probably don't care about. And as in the case when using Fiddler, there will always be other network traffic from the operating system or other applications running on your device. And this problem is just exaggerated when using Wireshark. And because of this, it is crucial that you're able to filter out as much data as you can. Um, and in addition, like in our experience, it is also a good, to, a good idea to use multiple recordings because there will always be some noise which you cannot filter out. And uh, thus, you'll just need multiple recordings, and you will have to compare the different recordings to look for patterns. Another helpful tip is to use a strict testing protocol. And this is helpful for multiple reasons, actually. It makes it easier to identify interesting data, as you kind of have an idea of when you expect it to show up. And it makes it easier to compare those sessions and look for patterns. And it becomes easier to reproduce and evaluate results later on. So this is the test protocol which we used during our testing. And like, as you can see, after five seconds of starting the recording, we, press, we, pressed, uh, we started the application. And then about 10 seconds later, we pressed the play button inside the application. And then shortly afterwards, we asked the doll a first question, a very general question. And then at about the minute mark, we asked uh, Kyla about the weather. And this process was repeated at least three times for each doll and each operating system. So let's just go into the demo of Wireshark. And as mentioned earlier, this data was captured using uh, the iOS app and Kyla. OK, so right here, this is Wireshark. And uh, first off, let's just go through the different columns here. The first one shows the time of the packet. And the next two columns shows the source and destination. And notice that this can be in both IP and as a MAC address. Then we have the protocol. And then we have the length. And this length is in bytes, but it also includes uh, headers of the protocol. And then we have some more general information about uh, the packets. And then at the bottom here, we have some more detailed information about the selected package. 
And as you can see, like, there's a quite a lot of data here. Uh, in fact, this is a recording which lasted a bit over a minute, and we have captured uh, four, over 400 packets. And this is in a fairly isolated network. And, uh, but the first helpful thing we can do is to turn on color filtering. And by doing this, uh, Wireshark will try to color code the different packages depending on uh, a rule set, which you can actually find here. And you can also edit it, of course. And you can also select the package, and you can press Control-1. And Wireshark will try to color code the different packages it thinks belongs to, which belongs each to each other. But let's just begin at the top here. And the first package is coming from the ARP protocol, which is the address resolution protocol, which, again, is a very low-level protocol, which we do not really care about. And to filter it out, we simply go up to the filter right here, and we can write not ARP. It's very easy. And the same for the next protocol, which is SSDP. And this is a protocol which is used to enable power uh, to enable plug-and-play functionalities for devices such as printers on the network. And it's not very interesting. So we can remove this as well by simply writing and not SSDP. Like, you get the point there. And <clears throat> but the things we are looking for, though, is data either going to our device or from our device, in this case, our phone. And if you know the IP address of your device, this is very simple. You can simply write and IP adder and then the IP address. Let's see. Yes. So now we should only be able to see messages that are either going to or from our phone. And if you go a bit down there, we can see that because of the TCP protocol, we have a lot of these acknowledgment and sync messages. And I personally, I think they just clutter up the feed. But a simple way to remove them is that we can ensure that the packets must contain at least some data. To do this, we simply write and tcp.length, oops, and not <laughs> TCP length less than one, which simply again ensures that the data must contain, well, well, the packet must contain some data. This doesn't remove uh, TCP retransmissions, though, which again can be a bit annoying. So to filter them out, we simply write and not TCP analysis, let's see, dot retransmissions. Um, and there isn't any particular field in the TCP header which tells Wireshark that it is a retransmission. So this is actually Wireshark, which is clever enough to see that, oh, hey, I recognize this package. So this has to be a retransmission. So it's quite clever. And by using this simple filter at the top pair, we have removed about 75% of the packets, which will make this a lot easier to see what exactly is going on. So if you just go to the top here, like we'll see that there's a DNS request to gstatic.com. And this is a Google server used to offload traffic from its main servers. And shortly afterwards, there's a couple of requests to gstatic. And the timing makes it seem relevant. Like, as you can see, this happened at around the five second mark, which was when we started uh, the application. Uh, but this is actually just noise. If we had compared this with our other recordings, you would have not have found this request. So this is why it's important to do multiple recordings and compare. But we can, of course, remove this by simply writing and not ip.adder again, and then the IP address of gstatic. Yes. OK. But shortly after, again, around the five-second mark, we see another request. This guy, this time going to a site called Nuance Mobility, actually. And if you, do, if you search up this name, you will uh, recognize it being a speech recognition company. So this, like, this, is being, this is looking very interesting. Yeah? And then it becomes quite, rather quiet until around 20 seconds which was when we asked Kyla our first question. And we can see that this, uh, these messages are going to Nuance by looking at the IP address and comparing the answer of the previous DNS request. <coughs> uh, 
And we can see that this goes on for about eight seconds. And we can see that the packets, packets are quite large by looking at the length column over here. And right at the end there, we see that there's a packet coming in return from Nuance. And then just right after, we observe one, let's see, two, three, four calls or requests to this IP address right here. And unfortunately, there wasn't any DNS request this time, but that's because it belongs to Wikipedia, and the IP address is probably cached on our phone. And right at the end there of the last request, Kyla will have an answer ready for us. And then it suddenly becomes rather quiet again, until about the 60-second mark, or the minute mark, when we ask Kyla a question about the weather, when we again see all these packages going to Nuance. And again, at the end, there's a DNS request going to the weather service called Weather Underground. And shortly after, there's a request to Weather Underground, which is sent by HTTP, which again, it is not encrypted. So we can actually go into Wireshark and we can look at the response. Right there, we can select the package. And we can see that this is uh, the weather forecast for Oslo. So, yeah. And, well, uh, you can uh, display JSON data inside Wireshark, but it's not as easy to watch as when using Fiddler. Fiddler is a lot better to format JSON data. So from looking at the data, it seems pretty obvious that voice data is being sent to this company called Nuance. But since the data is encrypted using SSL, uh, we cannot directly confirm this. What we can do is look at the amount of data being transferred. And so let's just adjust our filter to only include the data being sent to Nuance. And there's a shortcut way of doing this. We can actually select one of the packages going to Nuance, and we can select as, apply as filter and as selected. And currently we're just watching all the packets, packages that are going between our phone and two Nuance. And now we, what we want to do is look at the accumulated amount of data being transferred. There isn't any easy way of doing this in Wireshark, but I can show you how it can be done. You go into statistics and then select packet length, and then we just copy our filter. We find that there's been sent about 60 packages with an average size of 470 bytes. And it's important to remember that this includes header information, including like TCP header and SSL, which is about 70 bytes. So the actual uh, package size or data size is closer to 400 bytes. <coughs> so just like uh, a simple calculation, and this is about 24 kilobytes of data. Uh, and we averaged uh, the result over our other recordings, and we found that the average size was about 23 kilobytes. Let's just go back to the presentation, and we can continue. Yes, so 23 kilobytes of data was transferred to Nuance, a company that specializes in voice recognition. And if they had encoded this file using a standard MP3 file format, which you usually use for music, uh, which is encoded at 120 kilobits, typically, this would be about 1.5 seconds of recorded sound which obviously is not enough. But uh, MP3 is made for music, though, not the human voice. And it turns out that you actually don't need more than about uh, 12 kilobits to transfer voice at what is known as tall quality level, level, which is what you would get on an old analog phone. And the reason for this is that the frequency band of human voice is about a fifth of what you need for music. And furthermore, the recording is in mono, not stereo. So if you use this new bitrate, we find that it is actually those 23 kilobytes of data is enough to transfer about 15 seconds of voice recordings, which seems very plausible. <coughs> and just to summarize, like even though we are not able to directly observe that this data was indeed voice recordings, we have very good indirect evidence, such as when the data was being sent from the door, as in just after we asked Kyla a question, where the data was being sent, 
as in a speech uh, recognition company. And of course, that the file size was in the range what in what you could expect it to be. We, of course, also wanted to check the communication between the doll and the mobile phone. And when we, when we did that, we, of course, had to use completely different tools. The dolls use, you, ah, this, this animation should have been a lot cooler if it had been moving. Uh, the dolls use Bluetooth to communicate with the mobile device. And to avoid interference, Bluetooth uses frequency jumping. This means that in contrast to, for instance, FM radio, the frequency, frequency is changing all the time. Typically, you will have a new frequency for each, pa each packet. So you will constantly have to, change, to tune the radio to be ready on, this, on the right frequency to catch the next packet. Because of this frequency jumping, Bluetooth is pretty hard to monitor. A lot harder than, for instance, Wi-Fi that stays, st stays on the same frequency most of the time. And when we had this great project, we used the opportunity to buy lots of cool hardware to be able to follow this. And since uh, these devices can be interesting for you on your current or next project, or just something you want to buy and have fun with, fun with I will explain a bit about each of them. I'll start out with explaining the Bluetooth Love Energy Sniffer. Bluetooth Love Energy is even though it has the same name as Bluetooth, it is kind of different. It has a bit less uh, encryption, and it has a lot less frequency jumping. That makes it a lot simpler to monitor. Uh, this Bluetooth Low Energy Sniffer, it listens on the announcement channels on, uh, on Bluetooth, and when a connection is done, it follows the handshakes and is able to follow the frequency jumping and uh, it, it can pipe the data directly into Wireshark. It can also show you all the Bluetooth Low Energy, energy devices in the area. So the, and the software for it is very simple to use. It's just install the driver and you'll be up and running by no time. So this is a very neat device and it's also very cheap compared to a lot of the rest of the toys there. Uh, Bluetooth Classic is a lot harder. It has pretty decent encryption, and it does a lot more frequency jumping. It has more channels, and it jumps faster. And to know the next channel, you need to decrypt the previous packet. So it's more er 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 erratic how it jumps. And because of this, you, you will need dedicated hardware to follow the jumping. Because if you did it on the computer, you wouldn't know, you, it will not be fast enough to be on the right frequency to get the next packet. You could, of course, have 80 or something receivers and then catch all the traffic and then compile it at the end, but that would be really impractical. So someone made this eBetooth. It's uh, open source, and it got lots of open source tools to, 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 to use it, but it's difficult to use, and you should plan to, s to spend a few very long nights to get it up and running, but um, it's fun. And then my personal favorite, HackRF. There is a few different, um, there is more of this, but this is the original one. I think there is Blade, uh, or, uh, Blade something, it's also an option for doing this, but it's basically a software-defined de radio. That means that you will you use this, and then you build your, soft, your radio receiver in, in software, so you can use it to catch almost anything. The frequency range on this is very good, so you can use it to look at the signaling from everything, from garage door openers to, to airplanes and even satellites. And the um, cool and a bit scary thing about this one is that it's also a transmitter. <coughs> So all the things you can receive, you can also send by making your own the transmitters. So you could start opening people's garage doors, and you can even send fake GPS signals. There is already someone has made software for that, so you could send people astray. So never do this. Uh, for, some, <laughs> for some strange reason, 
uh, there is export control on this device. <laughs> so if you buy it, you will have to be prepared to answer a few questions from the US government. And you have to promise that you will not sell it to Iran, North Korea, and not using, use it to build weapons of mass destruction. Or Boss was a bit worried when he got the email about uh, the <laughs> export thing because we told him to buy this. But we got it, and it's not that hard. Just say no on all the questions. <laughs> uh, we, but we, it turned out that we were a bit disappointed. Like, at least we managed to buy all the fancy tools. But then we looked at the actual device, and <laughs> it turned out that we didn't need any of the tools because there was no authentication at all at Kyla. It announced itself as a top toy Kyla, and anyone could just connect to it. No authentication, you do not need physical access to the door, and anyone can connect. And when you connect, you could listen to everything that is said in the room where Kayla is, and you can make her say anything. So, like, and this is a toy that your, your child is trusting, and whoever could just start talking to your children through the doll, so that was really creepy. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So, to be on the safe side, we did, of course, pick the dolls apart. And we had already gotten quite a bit of attention at the office going around with kids' toys, but it definitely reached like a new level when we tore them apart and we took pictures <laughs> of the remains out in the hallway. You're we like dragging the head off and like <laughs> using, a, using a saw to get them. <laughs> And like, when we opened them up, like, we found, of course, the Bluetooth chip, and we found the documentation, and we found that it supported something called secure simple pairing. And like, this is a direct quote from that documentation. It is useful whenever product implementers want to make the user experience easier and accepted the increased risk of security attacks. And I'm not sure if the parents who bought these toys for their children would have accepted the increased risk of security attacks had they known. And like this could have been avoided uh, uh, multiple different ways. And, but the main advice here is to ensure that the user must have some kind of physical access during the pairing process, which after all is the most vulnerable process in the Bluetooth uh, classic protocol. And this could be as simple as there being some kind of button which needs to be pressed on the device during the pairing process. If you're like a bit more serious, maybe a pin code shown on the device itself, ideally randomized each time. But the best thing is, of course, a combination of the two. And uh, yeah, unfortunately, we are a bit running a bit short on time, so we have to skip this part of the presentation. But of course, we had looked at another doll as well. We could talk about the dolls with you afterwards if you're interested in the Hello Barbie. Yeah. Uh, but like, just to keep it yeah, short. We, dis we dis dissected that one as well. <laughs> yeah, but like, to keep it short, like this is a pretty similar doll, and she's a button on her belt, and to talk to her, you have to keep a button on her uh, belt pressed. Because if you don't, the microphone gets cut off, and it's actually done by in hardware. So like, regardless what kind of software access an attacker might be able to get, there is no way you're going to listen through that microphone unless that button is being pressed. But let's move on to the next subject, which is the application itself. Because much of what Kyla and IQ can talk about cannot be found in the data streams of uh, in Fiddler or Wireshark. And we suspected that these messages might be uh, pre-recorded or stored in the application itself somehow. So we wanted to take a look to see what we could find. And to do this, uh, we had to decompile the application. And when it comes to Android applications, this is very simple. Like it was, uh, we did a quick search and we found this online decompiler, and it's as easy as uploading the APK, which is basically in the installation file for an Android application, and it will give you the whole source code. And this is an example of the code we got back. It looks to maybe be some leftover or a unit test, I don't know. Uh, but what I want to show you is that all of the classes, methods, variables, and assets all have their proper names. It's very easy to read this code. Um, 
And yes, like code written on the Android platform is so easy to retrieve that it basically should be treated as public. Yeah. On iOS, this is unfortunately very hard. So we had to do, it, do this only on the Android. Yes, on the iOS devices, it is encrypted. But like this is a picture of the folder we got back. And like if you're an Android developer, I'm sure that some of these files and file structures look very familiar to you, like the Android manifest file. And uh, <coughs> because we were looking for the pre-record messages, we thought that the asset folder would be a great place to start. And inside there, we found the language folder, where again, we found a text file. And inside this text file, we found some of the stories that Kyla was telling us. But it was clear to us that this was not everything that Kyla was able to say because we had heard her say a lot of other things which we could not find in this small text file. So we went back and we found this strange file called Kayla CD, and we managed to figure out that it was in fact a SQLite database, but it was encrypted. Um, but we weren't quite ready to give up though. So uh, like we wanted to look through some of the code to see if we could figure out like how to open it, or at least tell us something about how it was being used. And because of the limited budget on this project, it was like we had the time to do a full code review of the whole thing. But what we instead started by doing is just to search for all the files with the name database. And this is really the first result that showed up, this database helper.java. And inside this file, like there's some imports and a class declaration <laughs> that, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the database password. Yeah, like it was, <laughs> it was like extremely convenient for our project. And like, <laughs> we have of course just shown you this password, but we have blacked out some of it, you know, just to make it a bit more fun if some of you want to try this at home. Well, so we went back to the database, opened it up, entered the password, and of course it worked. And <clears throat> there are 16 tables in this database. But the one that really caught our eyes was the one at the top pair, which is called bad words. Because, you know, as it turns out, the database does not only contain the pre-recorded messages, what Kayla can say, it of course also contains all the words <laughs> they are not allowed to say, which we of course thought were very funny. <laughs> and <laughs> because of this great list right here, uh, Genesis toy claim that uh, these toys are kid safe internet. They have this really cool logo to go with it. And <laughs> like this was kind of funny, but uh, it wasn't really what we were looking for. So we went back to the other tables and we found thousands upon thousands of pre-recorded messages, which was way more than we could ever look through ourselves. So we asked the consumer council for help and they looked through it for us. And uh, what they found were some pretty good stuff because it turns out that Kyla uh, likes Disney. She says things like, I've seen The Little Mermaid maybe only 100 times. It's my favorite, it's my number one Blue Ribbon favorite movie ever. And uh, this wasn't the only example, because Kyla really likes Disney, and she loves telling you about it. And not too surprisingly, it turns out that uh, Genesis Toys, again the creator of Kyla and IQ, have a marketing deal with Disney. And Kyla is uh, marketed itself as being your child's best friend. And for obvious reasons, this is, this is not okay. In reality, she's a hidden marketing tool aimed at your children. Yeah, so to the findings. Uh, we did, of course, write a nice report, a report with um, tables, graphs, and pictures. And the report is available on the internet for all of you to read. Unfortunately, the URL where it's found is like this long, so it makes no sense to put it on the slide there. But if you Google toy fail, it, that will be like among the top results. And if you can't find it, just mail us, Twitter us, and we'll send you the URL. Yeah, this is some of the toy. Like we tested like the range and all stuff, so there is some parts of it. Uh, we don't have enough time to go through all the results, but uh, Consumer Console made a short video that uh, shows the highlights of what we found, so we'll show you the video instead. There are some toys you really don't want in your home. 
This is Kayla and IQ. Unfortunately, these two internet connected toys are not as innocent as they look. There is not added any kind of security. With simple steps, I can talk through the doll and listen to other people. No one wants, wants others, others to speak directly to through the doll. doll. Or use it to eavesdrop to what is being said. That this can happen from a long distance makes it even scarier. And you may think that the conversation remains between the child and the doll. It does not. The conversation between the child and the doll is directly sent to a company in Burlington, Massachusetts, who can practically do whatever they want with the recording. And if that wasn't enough, when you use the toy, you also accept terms that allow the company to use the recording of the child for targeted advertising. It can share it with practically any third party they see fit and they can change the terms at any time without notice to you. This is, in our view, a massive breach of many consumer laws. Kayla, can I trust you? I don't know. <laughs>
Very few. Toy companies because of this? No, they were totally silent. We never heard anything from them. So we were kind of surprised because we were very prepared that they would come back to us and say, your report is wrong. And, but they were silent, really silent. Crawled under the carpet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. A big hand. Thank you.